Yeah, we're good. You just put your cell phones on vibrate. I'll do the same thing. <laughs> going to be a little windy today probably and we're probably going to feel it uh, Shmuel, for next week we should try to arrange the mic again we well, found the mic right yes. okay just for next week okay perfect welcome everybody Thank you for joining us. I know the wind may be powerful, but I'll try to speak a little louder so everybody will be able to hear. Today's class is dedicated by Razel Rubin in loving memory of her mother, Chayayenta Bas Rachel, in tribute to the yard site on Ches Adir Sheni, Tehei Nishmas Atzrura, Betzreir HaChayim, and be an eternal source of light and blessing and inspiration for you and the entire family and all of the Jewish people, and thank you. The class is also dedicated by Mrs. Dina Schusterman from Atlanta in honor of her parents, Reb Chaim Itcha and Leah Drizen, in honor of their 52nd wedding anniversary. They have taught me the value of learning and growing and She's dedicating the class in honor of their anniversary. Mazel tov. Larichis yamim v'shanim toivis metoichar chavis adas and a lot of health, happiness, nachas, prosperity. Thank you so much. Next week we'll also have a class. It'll obviously be the class before Purim, two days before Purim. So the topic today and next week is going to be Purim. You can hear me? Yes. Yeah? You can hear Okay. <laughs> There is a, ver a fascinating argument among our sages, among the Chachamim, which part of the Megillah we're obligated to read on Purim. It's in Tractate Megillah and the Gemara Maseches Megillah, Daf Yutes, page 19. A Mishnah and a Gemara. You wouldn't think it would be an argument, but uh, we, argue about lot of, we argue about a lot of things. And one of the arguments is, we know that on Purim, the entire Jewish world, men and women and children, listen to the story of the Megillah, which is called the Book of Esther, Megillah's Esther, the Scroll of Esther, which chronicles and describes the entire narrative of the events leading up to the great miracle and salvation of Purim and the subsequent events. The question became, there are ten chapters in the Megillah. Which part are you obligated to read on Purim? And there's many different opinions. One opinion is that you start reading the Megillah from Takfa Shal Mardachai, the story of Mardachai. Ish Yehudi Haya Beshushan Abiru Shmai Mardachai. Another opinion is you start reading the Megillah from the story of Haman, Takfa Shal Haman. Acher Hadvarim Me'ela, Gidel Hamelech, when the king Achashverish appoints Haman as his prime minister, and he ultimately. I thought I shot this. <laughs> and he ultimately. Sorry, and he ultimately convinces and persuades the king to issue forth the genocidal decree against the Jewish people, to destroy Khalila, all of Klal Yisrael in one day, young and old, women and men. Another opinion is, no, you begin much later, chapter 6, the night when the king, Achashverish, could not sleep, and he wants to reward, and he ultimately rewards the person who saved his life years ago from an assassination attempt, which is ultimately Takfay Shal Neis. That's where the miracle begins. The halacha is like Reb Meir. Reb Meir says, Kairi Eskula. You read the whole Megillah from the opening, from Takfay Shal Achashverish, from the story of Achashverish becoming a king, and three years later, he decides to throw a lavish feast that lasts 187 days, 180 days he throws a feast for all of his servants and all of his ministers and all of his 
uh, attendants and everybody who works in the royal Persian palace. And then after that, another seven days, he makes a feast for all of his subjects. All of the people, the Persian people who live in the capital city in Shushan, young and old, everyone is invited to this lavish, week-long feast. That's the first chapter. That's where you read the Megillah from. And despite the fact that there's so many different opinions, and everyone has a source and an explanation, as the Gemara explains, why you should start the Megillah from that section, the halacha, the law, remains from then till this very day, that we read the entire Megillah on Purim, from the beginning till the end, from chapter 1 through chapter 10. Which ostensibly, at first glance, the other opinions would seem perhaps to be logically more coherent or more sensible. Why? Because if we want to just read history, we could read a lot of history. I mean, you can also read about when was Achashverish born? Where did he grow up? Where did he go to school? <laughs> if he went, what did he do before he became a king? Which Chazal discuss in various Medrashim and Gemaras. How did he become a king? You could also discuss Vashti, where she was born, when she was born. She was from the family of Nebuchadnezzar, grand, a granddaughter of Nebuchadnezzar. How she became the queen, how did she marry Achashverosh? It's all fascinating history. But we read none of this. Why? The answer is because we're focusing on the celebration of Purim. If we're focusing on the celebration of Purim, then the question is, should we not just not, should we focus exclusively on the story of Purim? The story of Purim, you could begin in a few places. You could begin, you could begin with the story of the Gzeir. There's a man, Haman, he's a prime minister, he convinces the king to make a decree to annihilate the Jewish people. He is successful. The king issue forth the decree and the subsequent narrative that follows. That makes sense. That's indeed one opinion. You want to go back a little earlier to tell us who Mordechai is, who Esther is, so we can understand the characters. So you could start from Ish Yehudi. There's a man named Mordechai. There's a girl named Esther. Achashverosh is looking for a queen. She ends up with Esther. Even though you can argue, it's a fascinating story, but it's not directly the story. But, okay, you want to give context to Mordechai and Esther. You can argue as another opinion. Rashbi says, no. Why should we talk about the decree? It's a yomtif. It's a time to celebrate. Let's talk about the miracle. We know there was a decree. Haman wanted to kill the Jews. It was almost successful. And now let's talk about the salvation. The king can't sleep. He doesn't know what to do. He's suffering from insomnia. His advisors are reading the diary of the palace. They find out that Mordechai, they remember that Mordechai saved him. The king says, let's reward him. He rewards him the next day. Esther invites the king to a party. He comes to a party, a second party. Haman is executed and the Jewish people are saved. Let's get down straight to the business. To the, to business. Talk about victory celebration. But the halacha follows none of these, none of these opinions. The Lacha follows the opinion of Reb Meir, who says that the first section that we have to read on Purim doesn't have to do with Purim. It doesn't even have to do with Mordechai. It doesn't even have to do with Esther. It has to do with a king who, after three years of his reign, decides to throw a party for 187 days. And then the Megillah gets into details about the menu about the type of fabrics that were used at the party, the types of cups that he used, the fact that he wanted everybody to drink, the fact that he himself got inebriated and drunk, the fact of knowing exactly where the party was, how long it lasted, who was invited to the party. Not only that, but the details, chur, karpas, tchelus, we have to know the exact materials that were used and embroidered and introduced in order to make this a very lavish, which is all, it's certainly a very interesting story. But there are endless stories that we can discuss about Achashverosh and about how the palace ran. And then we come to the point that he wanted Vashti to show up and Vashti refused and he was infuriated and now he made a committee to figure out what do we do with Vashti and they decided to eliminate Vashti. And now the king is in a depression because he misses his queen. So now he discusses with his therapists or whatever they looked like in Persia, what do I do about my depression? And the answer is, we have to find a replacement for Vashti. And the search goes out. Now, obviously, it all leads up to the story. But nonetheless, the halach is that we have to read 
about the party and we have to read all the details, even though that's mamish, not relevant to the Purim story, although it was all a beginning of it and a prelude to it, but then go back even further. Why did that become the halacha? And especially, it's not just reading a story. When you read the Megillah, you read it with a blessing before and a blessing afterward. Baruch atah Hashem alakeinam alachelam ashakadoshanu b'mitzvaysa v'tzivanu al mikru Megillah. It means it's considered a mitzvah, kedoshanu b'mitzvaysa, to read the Megillah. We make a... Sha'asanisim, sha'achiyanu. And not only that, you're not supposed to miss a word of the Megillah. In other words, every word is part of the mitzvah. And you're not to make a blessing and stop, interrupt, and then do the mitzvah. We're supposed to do the mitzvah right after the blessing. This means that the first chapter of the Megillah is not an interruption. It's a part of the Kitishanu b'mitzvah of Itzivanu. It's part of the mitzvah. And not only that, every word becomes indispensable. So that means all of those details are essential and indispensable to the story of Purim. That's why the other sages argue. It's an interesting story, but we don't have to read it on Purim. You want to read it on your own? Read it on your own. What is the meaning behind this? How are we supposed to understand this? But the truth is that it's this halacha that became the verdict for the Jewish people on Purim that really captures one of the key essential components of the entire story of Purim. There's a very interesting statement in Gemara elsewhere in Tractate Chul in page 139. The Gemara asks, Esther min atayra minayin. What's the source of Esther and Torah? Which seems to be a strange question. What do you need a source for Esther and Torah? But that's what the Gemara asks. And the Gemara answers, it comes from a very powerful, if tragic, verse in Chumash. Moshe Rabbeinu, at the end of his life, is speaking to the Jewish people. And in Parshas Vayelach, just a, a few days before he passed away, or the very day he passed away, he tells the Jewish people about a time of Noichi Haster Aster Pane Bayoimahu. Hashem says there may be a day that I will hide my face. The word Haster Aster, which means I will conceal, I will hide, I will eclipse my face. The word Hester in Hebrew means concealment. The Gemara says this is the source of Esther and Torah. What's the connection? Esther is a name of a queen who lived so many generations later, lived a mil- millennium after Moshe Rabbeinu. A millennium, that's a long time. Yet the Gemara says the source of Esther in Chumash is Hanoichi Haster Aster. In fact, Chazal say that in Persian, the word Astarha, Esther, in Persian means the moon. Which of course emerges at nighttime when it's dark. When there is darkness, when there is concealment, there is the moon. Because the name Esther in Persian means the moon, which comes out during nighttime. What's the connection between the two? Why does the Gemara mean that Esther is rooted in a time of Anoichi Haster Aster Panai? And the answer to that is, or one of the explanations is, that Esther represents that personality, that Jew who's living not in a time when the Shekhinah, when God's presence is revealed, but when it's completely eclipsed. In fact, in the whole Tanakh, there's 24 books of Tanakh, 24 Svarim. The Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ksuvim. There's only one Safer in the whole Tanakh that doesn't have Hashem's name mentioned in it. Not even once. And that is Megillus Esther. It's a fascinating thing. The Tanakh is basically the divine blueprint for life. Every one of the Svarim is filled with Hashem's name. Especially Chumash and especially the prophets and the writings. Even the Song of Songs is a metaphor about the relationship between Hashem and Knesset Yisrael. Ani l'daydi v'daydi li. And even there, it's written as a metaphor and as a poem, a very, very powerful poem of affection and love. Hashem's name is also mentioned at the end in chapter 8, Rishafer, Rishfei, Shalheves, Yutke. But in, in the Megillus Esther, Hashem's name is not even mentioned a single time. And it's strange. You would think, with all the celebrations, like Yehuda, Maisa'ira, Vesimcha, Vesasim, Ikar, it should say they thanked Hashem. In fact, Esther tells Mordechai, go gather all of the Jews and fast for three days. It wasn't just to fast they shouldn't eat. It was a form of awakening, a national renaissance, an awakening, spiritual uh, transformation and shuva. But it doesn't mention the name of Hashem even once. It's intimated in Ramazim 
There's many gematrias and Russia tevis and Sefer tevis and Svarim, acronyms of words. Yavoy HaMelech V'Homon Hayoyim, the Arizal says is acronym Yutke Vavke. Esther tells Achashverosh, let the king and Haman come today to the feast. So Yavoy HaMelech V'Homon Hayoyim is Yud and He and Vav and He. <laughs> but you understand, Hashem is intimated in the words, the king and Haman should come today to a party. The Sefer of Esther is also the only Sefer in Tanakh that its story takes place outside of Eretz Yisrael. The Chumash takes place, of course, from the creation of the world, through the exodus of Egypt, and the journey to Eretz Yisrael. But after that, everything from Sefer Yehoshua and on, all takes place within Eretz Yisrael, within the land of Yisrael. The times of the judges, the times of the kings, the times of the prophets. The only exception for that is Sefer Esther. You have Daniel and Ezra and Nehemiah, and they deal with the Jews in Jerusalem at the end of the first Beis HaMikdash, and then they're transported to Babylonia, and they recreate the Jewish community in Babylonia, and then Ezra and Nehemiah make a second Aliyah. But the only Sefer that's exclusively outside of Eretz Yisrael, after the destruction of the Beis HaMikdash, in a foreign monarchy, in a Persian empire where the Jewish people are not in their own homeland anymore, after the first Gullus of Babylonia and then Persia defeats Babylonia, is the Sefer of Esther. Also the content, so we have the name of Hashem is absent, the geogra geographical location is outside of Eretz Yisrael, after the Jewish people are now an exiled nation for the first time in their history. Most importantly, the theme of the Sefer is one in which the Jewish people come closest ever to extinction. The first time in history, in recorded history, that Haman almost successfully executes his genocidal plan, which was not to exterminate part of the Jewish people. But that every single Jew to the last one, Khalila, in one day should be exterminated. And it's not like some of them can escape elsewhere. Because Achashverosh is a Moshal Bekipa. He was the superpower. Persia was the superpower of the time. And as the Megillah opens up, he rules Mehoiduvat Kush. From India to Ethiopia, the various interpretations of Hoiduvat Kush, Sheva Ve'esrim, Amaya Medina, over 127 provinces. So wherever Jews would escape to, it's under the domain of Achashverosh, and it's all happening in one day. It's not like stretched over days or weeks or months or years, so this one can hide here, this one can hide there. In that sense, it was the greatest gezerah ever against the Jewish people. And at that moment, the Gemara says, this is Vanoichi Haste Aster Pane Bayaimahu. This is the ultimate concealment of the Shekhinah. Haste Aster, that's what Esther represents. And here, when the story of Purim happens, Mordechai pleads with Esther to go to her husband, to Achashverish, and try to resign, try to annul the decree. In chapter 4 of the Megillah. And we all know what happens. Esther tells Mordechai, I can't. Because you have to know who this man is. He's a Persian dictator. He's a tyrant. He's also a drunkard. And he has a rule that if you come in uninvited, you go out with a head shorter. It's been 30 days that he's not interested in me. He did not invite me to his chamber, to his inner sanctum or sanctuary. So for me to go in, to his private room, private chamber, without an invitation, the rule is, Achaz Dasay They immediately execute you, unless he extends the golden scepter and allows you to touch its point, and then you're granted life. But he hasn't invited me for 30 days, he's not interested. So you want me to go in and plead on behalf of my people, what's going to happen? I'll go in, and what's going to happen? I'll be dead, so I'll be dead and the Jewish people will be dead. It doesn't make sense, we have to... We have to devise another strategy, another plan. This is literally a suicide mission. You're not going to gain anything. All you'll gain is that I'm dead, so now your last ally in the palace is gone. Mardechai doesn't back off. Mardechai famously responds to Esther, and he presents to her one of the most dramatic messages in the whole of Tanakh. He tells her three things. Number one, Al tadami b'nafshech li'imolet beis ha'melech mikola yehudim. First of all, don't think that in the day of reckoning, you're going to be saved alone. Don't think that on the day that every Jew, Khalila, is going to be exterminated, they're going to say, oh, Esther, she's, she's immune. 
Ultimately, on the day of reckoning, you will be the same dirty, filthy Jew who deserves to be exterminated like any other Jew. The fact that you're in the palace will not stop the Gestapo and the SS and the Hitler of the you, the Hitler of the time, Haman, to exterminate you. The second thing Mordechai tells her is, Kim hacheresh tacharishi ba'es hazois, revach v'hatzala yamad la'yehudim ha'makamache. If you're going to be silent at this moment, there will be salvation for the Jewish people. Salvation will come from another place. But va'atu beis avich tevedu. But you and your father's home, your family, as the Mepharshim say, will forfeit the opportunity, the opportunity of a lifetime, to be able to do what you have to do at this moment. And he concludes his final words, And who knows, this is how the Evan Ezra says, who knows, this is how the Evan Ezra interprets the words, who knows if this is not the reason that you have become the queen in the first place. Years ago, Years ago, when you became the queen, Esther became a queen in the seventh year of Ahasuerus' reign. She was summoned already earlier. He interviewed her. He spent time with her. But in the seventh year, she became the official queen. This happened years later. This happened five or six years later in the twelfth year of his reign when Haman made the decree. So Mardukai says, who knows if this was not the reason, the divine providence, for this moment. And Esther decides to take the risk, and she tells Mardechai, she sends a message, as we spoke a few weeks ago, Leich Knois is Kola Yehudim, go gather all the Jews in Shushan, fast for three days, I will also do it together with my maidservants, together with the, with the young women who assist me, and then I will go into the king, not according to the law of Hashera, Vadati of Vadati, and if I perish, I will perish. And that's what happens. She fasts, and on the third day, she goes in, she dresses up with royalty, Vatilbash Esther Malchus, and she goes in to the king. This is chapter 5 of the Megillah. And he lies, he's enamored by her, he extends the golden scepter. She's not executed. He says, What do you want? I'll give you half of the kingdom. He's completely startled and overwhelmed in a positive way by her presence. And she says, I just ask you to come to a feast. At the feast, she invites him to the second feast, the next day. At the second feast, she spills the beans. I'm Jewish and Haman is trying to execute us. And that's when the Melech, the king, kills Haman at that party. The Gemara Meseches Megillah tells a story that Blavi said that when Esther was walking into the king, the first time she didn't know if she's going to make it. Because again, he hasn't invited her for 30 days. So she went into the pre-chamber, to the corridor, to the foyer. And there was a base at slum and it was filled with pagan deities of idolatry. And when Esther saw this, Chazal says she composed what's known today as Kapitel Chav Beis of Tehillim. The 22nd chapter of Tehillim, which is one of the most uh, emotionally heart-wrenching chapters according to our sages, was composed, or at least uttered, by Esther in that space. She is called Ayeles Hashachar. And the opening words are, Eli, Eli, Lama Azavtani, Rachek Mishuasi, Divrei Shagasi. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why have you neglected me? You're so far from salvation. You're so remote from the words of my outcry. And she continues, Rachik Mishwasya Lakai Ekra Veloy Sana Ekra Yoiman Veloy Sana Velaila Veloy Dumioli. I call out by day no response. And by night the silence. Bihabatchu Avaisenu, it's a very, very powerful, powerful mizmer, very powerful capital. So that is what Chazal means that Esther is rooted in that moment, Vanoichi Hasta Aster. When Moshe said there'll be a day that my face will be completely concealed by Yoimahu on that day, this is what Esther embodies. And yet, Esther, in that moment, listens to those words of Mardachai. What are the words of Mardachai? Even at such a moment, when everything seems bleak and dark, Esther means bleakness, you should know that there is divine providence here. In other words, the fact that Esther can call out and say, why did you abandon me? You can't ask somebody why you abandoned them if they abandoned you. If there's nobody here to talk to, there's nobody here to talk to. Esther is saying, Kaylee, Kaylee, Lama, Zaftani, 
Why do I feel that you have abandoned me? Who are you talking to if somebody abandoned you? The fact that you have to talk. I remember there was once uh, when I was younger, so in the shul where I was, they brought a professional educator to speak about educating and raising young children. Her first name was Peril. I forgot her last name. It was many years ago. So one of, the, one of the, the husbands or the wives asked a question and said that their child often tells them, I hate you. <laughs> You're a horrible, horrible mommy. <laughs> You're not a good mommy. You're really not a good mommy. So she was very worried and very she was a sensitive mother. She was so concerned. So she gave an interesting response. She says, I want to tell you something. She studied uh, orphanages and ho- foster homes. And she says in an orphanage and a foster home, a child won't dare to tell anybody working there, I hate you. I wish I had another mommy. I don't like you. Because they are so afraid of what the consequences will be. The fact that the child says this to you is already a good sign. They could talk to you this way because they trust that it's not going to be reciprocated. <laughs> As somebody once said, Rabbi Shay Taub said, you know, you, you don't, <laughs> your child doesn't have to be your best friend. Find other friends, but you need to be your child's best friend. The child has to know that in their parents they have that unconditional love and pride. The fact that Esther could say, Lama Zaftani, why did you run away from me? Means she feels she's speaking to a loving presence. Kaili, Kaili, Lama Zaftani. And at that moment, Mardachai tells her, Mio Ideya im Laes Can you sense, can you experience the fact that the Shechina, Hashem, put you in this position? For this moment. You say, but it's aster, aster. Aster, aster means the face is concealed. But it's not gone. It's not absent. It's not absence. In, like the Baal Shem Tov once said, anoichi haster, aster. In the haster, aster. In the concealment, there is anoichi. I concealed. The I is fully present in the hastara. And it's not one time aster. It's haster, aster. The concealment is also concealed because there's two types of concealment, the Baal Shem Tov says. There's a concealment that you're aware of. That's not such a concealment. The real concealment is the concealment is also concealed. When I know that I have a blockage, there's a blockage, but I can identify it. Like they say, Awareness of an illness is already half the cure. I know the problem. I know the doctor agrees. If you can identify you can identify the situation. Okay, we know what we're dealing with. We have to figure it out, but we know what we're dealing with. When the concealment is concealed, I don't even know that there's a concealment. In other words, the apathy or the indifference is so profound that darkness becomes light. I'm already accustomed to it. I don't even know that there's anything else. I know that there's a trauma. I know there's a trauma I have to work through. I can identify it. I can observe it. But I don't even know. The stuckness is so much part of my psyche that the hasta is also hasta. They say that there was once Hasidim that were gathered in Russia and they were having a Fabrengen and there was no wine on the table. So somebody said, go down to the cellar, there's wine. So one of the people went down and it was pitch dark. So he screams, it's pitch dark down here. So the person upstairs says, Varta par minut into the finsternish. You know when you're in a very dark room for a few minutes, what happens? Your eyelids expand and you become somehow accustomed to the darkness and you could find your way through, you could find your way in the darkness. So he says, wait a few minutes downstairs, you'll become accustomed to the darkness and everything will work out. So he screams up, he says, Fundem That's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that the darkness will become part of my comfort zone. I'll become used to it. In other words, dysfunction is dysfunction. When dysfunction becomes normalcy, when exile is redemption, when negativity and toxicity is the only thing I know about, ooh, this is the real hasta hasta. It's like the story that happened with Rabbi Avram Amalach, the Magad of Mizrich. Mizrich is a city in Ukraine. And he had a son known as Rabbi Avram Amalach. They called him Rabbi Avram the angel because he was like an angel. And once he came crying to his father, so his father said, Avramala, why are you crying? So he said that he was play- playing a, a game of hide and seek with his friends. So he says, so what happened? He says, I hid and they couldn't find me. So he says, so you won the game. That's the point. The point is that the hiding place that you chose was so good that they couldn't find you. He says, yeah, but they've been 
they stopped searching for me. And they just went away and got involved in a new game. So his father, the Magad of Mizrich, the Helika Magad, the Rebbe of Bear, started to cry. So he said, Tati, why are you crying? So he says, because it's the same story with Avinu Shabashamayim. And he started to talk to Hashem. His son told over the story. And he said, you hid. And you hid in order that we should look for you and find you. But you hid so well that people are going to stop looking for you. The hiding place is too, too powerful. They searched Sunday. They searched Monday. They searched Tuesday. They searched Wednesday. They searched Thursday. They searched Friday. David HaMelech says, Ad Masai Tastir as Panecha Mimeni. The Hester, the Aster, the Taster is so powerful. At that moment, Mordechai makes this statement that changes everything. This is not random. There is a reason that you were taken and abducted against your will by coercion in order to become a queen to save the day and save the Jewish people. And at that moment, Esther reinvented herself from a victim who was just kidnapped and her, her youth was, was, was stolen from her. Her future was stolen from her. Her entire identity of what life was supposed to look like for a young, beautiful, amazing, extraordinary Jewish woman was completely t- t- taken from her. But Mordechai allowed her at that moment, he empowered her to reinvent herself. And say, no, this is not a mistake. My story is not a story of tragedy. My story is a story of shlichus, of mission. Often, like this year, Purim is associated or in proximity to the parish of Vayikra. Vayikra, the Sefer Vayikra, this week is Vayikra. And the Shabbos is the Shabbos that precedes Purim. And the Zohar says... That the my name is Barchen Kula Yoimen. The days of the week always get their blessing from the Shabbos before. The opening of Sefer Vayikra is Vayikra El Moshe. Hashem calls out to Moshe. It doesn't say who, it just says Vayikra, he called out. You assume it's Hashem. Vayikra El Moshe, Vayidabre love me oil Mayod. And Hashem speaks to him from the oil Mayod. In the Sefer Torah, there is what's called Oisius. Ze'eris, Isis Gedolus, Isis Rapsius, Isis Rapsi, Isis Beninus. There's regular letters. There's sometimes you have a larger letter. It's written in a larger font. Then you have a tiny letter. The Aleph of Vayikra is an example of a tiny little Aleph. If you ever look in a Sefer Torah or in a Tikkun Lakaran, you'll see Vayikra. The Aleph is a tiny miniature Aleph. It's hard to see it. And the Sefer Torah they're going to read on Shabbos or they read Monday, Thursday. It has a tiny Aleph. Why? Rashi says something fascinating. He says, when Hashem called Bilam, Hashem spoke to Bilam later, in, in Parshas Balak, it says, Vayiker Hashem Elakim El Bilam. Vayiker means God chanced upon Bilam. So Rashi says, by Moshe it says Vayikra. He called out. By Bilam, he also spoke to Bilam. But it was like, in Hebrew there's a word mikre. He chanced. It was like almost a coincidence. Like you bump into somebody, Oh, I meant to uh, call you the other day. Yeah, it never happens. <laughs> oh, what a coincidence. You're here. I wasn't expecting. It was almost like God bumped into him. Vayikr. It was like a mikre, like a chance. Like a chance encounter. Not premeditated. It's not like I'm coming to see you. I call you. Could we spend time? Let's go out. Let's take a walk. Let's take a hike. Let's go for a coffee. Let's, uh, let's have a shmuis, let's walk together, let's travel together. That's Vayikra, I call out to you. Vayikra is like, it was my mistake. Well, you're here already, let me tell you what I have to tell you. What's the difference between the two? In Hebrew, there are two words. They're mamish the same words, but there's a difference of one letter. Mikre is mem kuf resh he. What does it mean? Mikre means a coincidence. Mikre nikre, it's a coincidence. Coincidences happen. Things happen. There's another word exactly the same. Mikra. With an aleph. Mem kuf resh aleph. What does that mean? A calling. Mikra ikaydish. A calling. Vayikra. I call out to you. Vikara zel zeviyamar. We call out. Mikra with a he is a coincidence. Mikra with an aleph is vayikra. A calling. 
the difference between Bilam and Moshe, it's two different experiences of life. It's two different philosophies in life. For Bilam, life is a series of coincidences. A lot of lucky ones, but it's all coincidences. Vayikr, it's all a chance. Everything is a chance. By Moshe, Vayikra, he doesn't see anything as a coincidence. Professor Albert Einstein once said, he says, there's two ways of living life. Either nothing is a miracle, or everything is a miracle. Because either nothing is a miracle, everything is just random good luck, or everything is a miracle. What's not a miracle? Study the tusk of an elephant. Study the properties in a droplet of water. Study the composition of a cell, or an atom, or a neuron. Either it's all random, and the randomness began with a big bang 15.3 billion years ago, and we just happen to have mazel that we ended up on some strange planet that supports life and nobody knows how and why. Or it's a calling. But Vayikra has a small Aleph. Aleph is Hashem. Aleph means one. Achtos, Echad, Hashem Echad. Number Aleph means one. Aleph means Alufo Shalom, the ruler of the world. Sometimes the Aleph is very small in the Vayikra. Sometimes you can't see and easily perceive the presence of the Aleph. Sometimes when you look around yourself or the world, it seems like it's all Vayikr. It's all a coincidence. It's all just bad luck. It's all just happenings that happen and occur, and you can hope for the best. Maybe you'll get some good mazel. Different cookies have different fates and destinies. Comes the Torah and says sometimes the Aleph is almost invisible. It's very small. It's very tiny. It's not conspicuous. It's not there in broad light. My face is concealed. The Aleph is small. And yet, Mordechai says, Esther, it's not a coincidence. There's a calling. This is your calling. This is your destiny. And that changes everything for Esther. She embraces it with vigor, with stamina. And she employs a plan that is highly, highly intelligent, you may even say shrewd, very, very nuanced of how she sets up that chess game in order to get her husband to be exactly where he has to be, Haman exactly where he has to be. He doesn't only invite her husband for a party. She could have done that. She says, Yavai HaMelech V'Haman Hayoy Malamishta. Really interesting. Imagine... A woman invites her husband, who's one of the most powerful person in the world, for an anniversary party. But she says, by the way, I also want the prime minister to come. What would the husband start thinking? The Gemara says, hmm, Esther really likes Haman. Now, not the first invitation, she said, let them come to the meal that I made for the king. At that party, she invites him for a second party, and she says, Yavay HaMelech V'Haman El HaMishta Asher Asisi Lohem. This time it's the party I made for both of you. And this is where Achashverosh completely went crazy. Now suddenly Haman is a mechutten. So now every date that I'm going to have with my wife Esther, Haman has to be there. Now Haman was the most trusted person by Achashverosh. Achashverosh was a paranoid man. Haman to Achashverosh was buried to Stalin, if you know Russian history. I don't know who Putin's man is yet. We have to find out. But Beria to Stalin, Beria fed Stalin his paranoia. He fed him. He fueled. Stalin was paranoid from here till the moon. And Beria, the head of the KGB, would feed it. Haman fed Achashverosh's paranoia. And suddenly, Achashverosh, the paranoid man, says, whoa, whoa, whoa. Haman and Esther, do they have something going on? This was all Esther's brilliance. This was all Esther's build. When you read the story, she was an extraordinary, besides everything else, she was also an extraordinary, brilliant woman. And sh- nobody knew she's Jewish. So she was in a position to play that game. But it all begins at the moment when she knows this is not a mistake. I'm not a victim. This is not a bidiyeved. My, my life is not a bidiyeved. It's like, okay, in my nebach situation, I'll make the best out of it. What do they say? Take lemon and make lemonade. That's not Esther. Esther doesn't take lemon and turn it into lemonade. Esther sees her life as a calling. Vayikra Hashem. It's a calling. It's not a calling that is easily seen. It's a very difficult situation. It's a dark situation. But that's Esther's uniqueness. 
And that transforms everything. Megillus Esther is called Megillus Esther. It's not called Megillus Mardecha. Even though he was behind Esther. He raised her, he mentored her, he inspired her, he guided her. At least he should get some credit in the name. Call it Megillus Mardecha ve Esther. You want to give Esther more credit, call it Megillus Esther u Mardecha. But the name is ultimately Megillus Esther. Because Esther is the one who embodies the essence of the story. And you see it even in the name, Purim. The name Purim is a very strange name. If you women were on a committee to decide how we should name the holiday of Purim. Okay, now, you know, hindsight is twenty twenty. But how would you really name it? If I told you the whole story, or you lived through the story, and you had to name the holiday, would anybody think to name the holiday by the name of Purim, which means casting a lot, a goyrel, because Haman, the Rosh Merusha, was looking for the right day when to kill the Jews, and he cast a lot, and it fell out on the 13th day of the month of Adar. Great, so that's why we have to name the holiday, because of his girl. And let's say Haman wouldn't have cast a lot. Let's say Haman would say, you know what, I'm going to kill the Jews on my Baba's birthday. Or on my Zayda, Agog, or Amalek's birthday. Okay, she'yekacha. He happened to cast a lot, so that becomes the name. I don't understand. <laughs> It seems like a very far-fetched name. It's not even a Jewish name. It's a Persian name. Goyril is the word. They could have called it Goyril. Goyralois. They don't even call it a Hebrew name. They give it a Persian. The only holiday by us that doesn't have a Jewish name. Pesach, Shavuos, Sukkot, Chanukah. Chanukah's Beis HaMikdash. They dedicated the Beis HaMikdash. That's the real name. That's what they did. The Beis HaMikdash was emancipated. That's why they could light a Menorah, because there was a Chanukah. Chanukah's Beis HaMikdash. Here, it's a far-fetched name. The truth is that the name tells the whole story. Because what is a lot? A lot is the essence of randomness. You say, you won the girdle. You know when they do a raffle? Why did you win? It's random. You got the right numbers. You won the lottery ticket. It's random. They tell a Gavaldica story that happened in the city of Dvinsk. Very interesting. Really such a Jewish story. <laughs> it's an interesting story. You know how they used to have in the Shtot, it was called Ashtot Ganev. Do they still have it? In every Jewish city, there was a Ganav, you know, you got to make a living some way. He was a known Ganav. Anyway, in Dvins, there was an Erlichiyid, a very fine Jew. He was a poor man. And he was walking in the street and he wasn't looking and he bumped into somebody. The guy says, oh, so I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I apologize. But it's Hashgacha Pratis, right? <laughs> you bumped into me. I'm selling lottery tickets. This is in the 1920s. I'm selling, selling lottery tickets for a nice girl. And you could buy one. The Jew says, I would love to, but I don't have anything. He says, I'll lend you a ruble, right? You'll pay me back. If you win, you'll certainly pay me back. And if not, you'll f- fine. So the Jew says, no problem. And he, you know, he spends a dollar and he buys, he buys the lottery ticket. Anyway, I guess this guy wanted publicity. So he publicized that this Jew purchased a lottery ticket in his guide. Now there was a Ganov in Dvinsk, a thief. And, you know, sometimes Jewish Ganovim still have some, uh, you know, they have some Jewish blood still running through the sinews. So he thought to himself, you know, this Jew, everybody knew was a tzaddik. He's probably going to dive in very hard to win because he needs the money. So probably his ticket is going to win. So the Ganov went into his house the night before and he exchanged his lottery ticket for the other guy's lottery ticket because this Ganov still felt that this Jewish ticket might win. <coughs> So he took this Jew, he took the, the tzaddik's ticket, and he gave him his ticket. Nudaibishad Gahalfin, who won? <laughs> the Ganav's ticket won. <laughs> the one that he exchanged. So now listen to a Ganav, somebody in scruples. He calls the Jew for a dintaira. Why? He says, I'm taka a Ganav, but it's my ticket. <laughs> I gave you my ticket. I stole your ticket. I'm a Ganav. But the ticket is mine. And therefore, <laughs> therefore, I get the money. So I got it, right? Call it a scrupulous person. So they went to a dintaira to Reb Meir Simcha Koyin of Dvinsk, the, the Ur Sameach, the Meshachachma. He was one of the great rabbinic figures of pre war Europe. He was the Rav of the Ashkenazim in Dvinsk. His, the other Rav was the Ragachave Gon. And Reb Meir Simcha, he was a Koyin. He wrote a Sefer Meshachachma on Chumash, Ur Sameach on Rambam. And he was the Rav of, Lat, of, of Dvinsk. They came to him. So he listened to both sides. The Ganav wanted all the money. 
It's his, it's his ticket. Only Jews can have such a dentaida, right? And the Meir Simcha said, the thief is wrong. So he said, why? Why? The guy didn't even know that I stole the ticket. So there was no yiyush. <laughs> he didn't despair. He says, it's simple. You thought, you think, your mistake is you think it's the lottery ticket that wins. The lottery ticket doesn't win. It's the person who wins because God wants them to win. So he says, your whole perception of life is skewed. You think your ticket won. Tickets don't win. We don't live in a random world. It's not numbers that win. It's people who are supposed to win because Hashem wants them to win. It's Bahashgacha. A lot, by definition, is has to aster. It's randomness. That was the uniqueness of Purim. Where does this message come out in the how we read the Megillah? Because when you look at the story, you know, when people read the Megillah, they think the whole story, it took a half an hour to happen, right? <laughs> there was a king, he threw a party. Haman came, he made a decree. Esther threw a party. They hung up Haman. They hung Haman. They tried to kill us. We won. Let's go eat. It didn't happen in a half an hour. It didn't even happen in six months. Achashverosh became a king. And then he reigns for three years. And after three years, he decides to throw a party. Now, if you were living at that point in history and you would look at this guy throwing a party for 187 days, what would you say? You would say the guy is an alcoholic. He's an addict. He also wants everybody's attention and validation. He's certainly a party animal. He knows how to throw a good party. No question. What does this have to do with anything meaningful in terms of the ultimate destiny of history? Nothing. It's just another event of a Persian shikir, a monarch. The Gemara says he was a melech tippish. He was not chafuloich. And he hated Jews more than Haman, according to one opinion in the Gemara. And he threw a party. Bachatzar, Ginas, Bisan Amelech. The Gemara says those who belonged in the courtyard, he took, but in the courtyard, there was placement cards. There were those who went to the garden, there were those who went to the Bisan, to the house. Everything was orchestrated. He hired the greatest designers, the greatest party planners. He did not allow any party poopers. He had exterior design and interior design. He had butlers and bars that were endless chefs with every conceivable type of wine and vodka and liquor and scotch, the best of Persian wines that were available at the time. It was all there. Kirtzayin Ishviyish. And Vashti made sure to host the women. The women also had the time of their life. It's an interesting story about Persian culture, certainly. Certainly about a guy who loves drinking. Certainly about a guy who loves partying. Certainly a guy who has 187 days to squander on a feast that doesn't stop. Fascinating. But what does it have to do with the Jewish people? What does it have to do with the ultimate objective of history? Nothing. I'm reading the story. Okay, it's a piece of news about the Persian White House and the appetites and interesting inclinations or addictions and temptations of our king, Achashverosh. That's the third year. Then is Amaisa with Vashti, another major scandal. The king gets rid of his wife. Then Memuchan wants they should send messages everywhere to squash any feminist revolution that Vashti may have triggered. Okay, another Maisa. Years pass. Four years pass till Esther becomes a queen. During those four years, a lot of things happened. <laughs> four years is not a small amount of time. It's the seventh year of Achashverosh's reign. And then comes a Maisa. Bixon and Seresh are assassinated because, uh, try to an uh, assassination attempt. Another story that's disjointed. Two people want to kill the king. Okay, it's not news in the world of history. This is how it happens. Many monarchs were assassinated. If somebody died a natural death in his bed, it was a unique gift and blessing. Achashverosh was speared. In the 12th year of Achashverosh's reign, Esther was already a queen for many years. And Mordechai used to walk every day to see how she's doing. Nobody knew she was Jewish. Haman, as the prime minister, comes out with this decree. And then, after this, suddenly, the domino begins. The domino effect begins to play out. And on the very day of the decree, or the next day, Esther decrees a fast for three days. She goes into the king. One party, another party, Haman gets executed. She goes back to the king, and she convinces him to send out letters allowing the Jews self-defense. And suddenly... When you look at the end of the story, like you realize that what happened 12 years earlier, and what happened 9 years earlier, and what happened 5 years earlier, it wasn't 
different stories. It was all one story. It's not disjointed. It's disjointed when you lack perspective. But when you see the bird's eye view of history, it was all one single story. It's like a symphony. There's different musicians, different instruments, different notes, but it's a single symphony. But what happens if I don't... Sorry, what happens if I don't have the eyes? I'm tone deaf. I don't have the ability to be able to... You know that game they used to have connect the dots? You know, remember that game, connect the dots? Right, it's a bunch of dots. Suddenly it's all connected. It's not mikra. It's all vayikra. It's me yodeim le'eis kazoi. So Hashverosh had to have a party and had to be drunk and had to summon Vashti and Vashti had to refuse and he had to go into a depression and Esther had to be summoned and Bixen and Seresh had to try to assassinate him. And years, years later you suddenly see la Yehudim hoi sa'ir v'sim chilasasim v'kar. Comes Reb Meir and this is the Allah and says you cannot read and celebrate la Yehudim hoi sa'ir v'sim chilasasim v'kar if you don't read vayihi b'mei ha'chashverosh. There's no la Yehudim ha'isa Eirev, there's no vayhib me'a chashverish. Why? Because that's the whole story of Purim. The whole story of Purim is that everything, even that which is not part of the story, is also essential to the story. Sometimes I see it immediately. Sometimes I don't see it at the moment. Sometimes the Aleph is invisible. Vayikra, it's very, very small. Sometimes it's hasta aster, it's completely concealed. Sometimes I just look and I say everything is random, it's just a goyrel. And it's not even a goyrel in Hebrew, it's a goyrel in Persian. It's not even in Lashen Kodesh, it's Purim. Everything is random, everything is random. Random means mikre, vayikr. And suddenly you see what Esther understood. Laes kazoisi gat malchus. Every single part of your story is orchestrated and choreographed by the author, the ultimate author of the story, to be able to bring to the moment of La Yehudim Ha'isa Eire V'simcha V'sasim V'kar. There was a lecture I once heard uh, some time ago. Actually, the story I read some time ago, a friend of mine from Israel sent it to me, Rabbi Shneir Ashkenazi, but I recently heard the lecture of the Jew. This is a Jew, Kenayin Har in his 90s. His name is Rabbi Yaakov Frank. Petach Tikva Israel. It's a rabbi in Petach Tikva for many years. And he, was a gra- he is a grandson of the famous Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank. Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank was the Rav, the Ashkenazic Rabbi of Jerusalem from 1936 after the passing of Rav Avram Yitzchak HaKoyen Cook until his own passing in 1960. Chaf Aleph he passed away at the end of 1960 and he was known as one of the greatest Talmudic minds in Jerusalem and in Israel, he was a very, he was also a tzaddik, Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank. He was a very, very well-known rabbinic figure and leader until his passing in 1960. His grandson is a Jew named Reb Yaakov Frank. And he once shared the following story. He, he shared this in a public lecture. There was a famous Lithuanian yeshiva, one of the great Lithuanian yeshivas, you probably heard of it, known as Slabotka. In the 1920s, the altar from Slabotka, Rafinko, Zechet Tzadik Levrach, they called him the altar, decided to bring the yeshiva to Eretz Yisrael. And the Rosh Yeshiva was from his family, Reb Moshe Mordechai Epstein, Zatzal, the great Lithuanian Slabotka Rosh Yeshiva, and he and the Alta, they went with the students up to Eretz Yisrael and they built the yeshiva in Hebron. Became known as the Hebron yeshiva, Slabotki yeshiva, <coughs> Knesset Yisrael of Slabotki in Hebron. The Alta of Slabotka passed away in 1927 and Reb Moshe Mordechai Epstein was the Rosh Yeshiva who led the yeshiva. And the yeshiva got a, acquired a great reputation and name. And boys from all over Eretz Yisrael, which was under the British mandate, and boys even from Europe, and even from America, there were five or six boys who traveled in the 1920s to Hebron to study in this yeshiva. There was a Jewish family. The father lived, I think, he said, either in Philadelphia or New Jersey, and he was very well connected. He was affluent. He said that this Jew, he thinks, was in the Congress. But he didn't remember his last name. And they 
were Torah Jews, and this, they had an 18-year-old boy who went to study in Hebron from America. But the parents got very concerned, because those years there were random pogroms that the Arabs would unleash against the Yishuv. It was a very small Yishuv in Eretz Yisrael. The British did not protect the Jews sufficiently. It was a very, very difficult time for the Jews in the Yishuv in the 1920s because they didn't have, they couldn't protect themselves. They were vulnerable. They were under the British. And the British were always, always <clears throat> trying to be fear, but very often extremely anti-Semitic. So the parents got very worried and they sent a message. They want their son back to come, come back to America. They don't want him to be in Eretz Yisrael. Reb Moshe Mordechai Epstein, the Rosh Hashiva, he felt very bad. He said, this is a young man, a brilliant mind. He's at 18, he's going to go back to America. There's no future for Jewish kids in America at the time. Remember, there was maybe one yeshiva, two yeshivas. Uh, this is 1928. There was nothing. America was a spiritual desert. The few families that could hold on to the children it was a miracle. People had to work on Shabbos. It was just there was no infrastructure of education. And once the kids were going to public school, even if the parents were from, you know, the next generation was lost. More than a million Jews assimilated during the late 1800s and early 1900s in America. Amer more than a million Jews were lost. So Rabbi Moshe Mordechai Epstein felt very bad that this child would leave, but the parents were insistent. So he asks the Rav of Yerushalayim, he wasn't yet the Rav of Yerushalayim, but he was one of the very great rabbinic figures in Israel at the time, Rabbi Tzvi Pesach Frank, who was connected to rabbis across America because they would ask him questions. He wrote shuvahs to many. If he could influence their rabbi in Philadelphia or New Jersey to convince the parents to leave the boy there. Now, Hebron was considered a calm place. Why? Because the mayor of Hebron was a famous Chabad Chassid Rebbe Lazar Don Slonim, and he was a banker, and he knew Arabic fluently, and he was well connected to all the Arabs in Hebron. It was considered a very safe place, because everybody needed him, and he was a very kind and generous person. Rabbi Lazar Don Slanim, and he ran Hebron. It was considered a calm, safe place. So Rabbi Tzvi Pesach Frank sends a message that Hebron is safe. Your boy is going to be a right in Hebron. Let him stay in the yeshiva. And because of his renown and influence, the parents acquiesced, and the boy stayed. A year later, you probably know the story about what happened in Hebron, Shabbos, Parshas, Ekev, Yud Ches of Tafresh Peites, August 1929, the, the, 20, the, the 18th day of Av. There was a massacre of the Jews in Hebron. It started on Friday, but it continued and mostly happened Shabbos morning around 9, 10, 11 in the morning. In fact, the Jews that were there and saw what's happening, they all ran into the house of Slonim. Elazar Don Slung said, in his house, nothing will happen. And they were davening there. And they broke into the house with axes and hatchets and knives. And they brutally and sadistically murdered 67 Jews of Hebron in his house and other places. Men, women, children, babies, old people, young people. And so many were brutally wounded. Some died from their wounds. 24 of the victims were yeshiva boys of Hebron, including this American, including this American boy. Uh, could be his name was Vexler, I'm not sure. I don't remember. He didn't know the name, but the Rosh Hashiva of Hebron today, Rav Hevroini, told me about an American boy who was murdered. He told it to me last Sunday, I met him. So it could be it was the same boy, but not sure. It was a Vexler boy who was murdered, but he was from Chicago. So I'm not sure if it's the same family. 24 of the victims were the... Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank was supposed to be Shabbos in Hebron because his brother-in-law was making an Ufrof. But this man telling the story, Yaakov Frank, was born Shabbos Yud Aleph of one week earlier in Yerushalayim. Reb Tzvi Pesach was the Zaydi, he had to be the Sandik. So he and his wife couldn't go to the Ufruf because the Enochal had a bris. So they didn't make it Shabbos to Hebron. Reb Tzvi Pesach Frank was devastated, not just because the loss of life, because he felt directly responsible for what happened to this boy. He guaranteed the parents that the boy will be safe, and the boy was murdered. 18 year old, 19 year old kid. He couldn't forgive himself for the advice that he gave, which ultimately claimed this boy's life. 
but he wouldn't talk about it. You know, Jews from that generation, there was so much pain, they didn't talk about it. Today we talk about things much more. He never spoke about it. But to his grandson, his grandson, Yaakov, grandson said, you know you're alive because of me. If I wouldn't have been born, you would have been in Hebron. But he was a relative of Slonim, he would have been there. So to him he used to speak about it. And he always, he said, this broke, his grandfather was a very sensitive person, Rabbi Yatzvi Pesach, he said this always just broke his heart. It was just such a personal wound for him of what he did to this, obviously he didn't do it, but what he caused to this boy and the grieving parents from America. And Rabbi Yaakov says years pass, he grows up, he was born in 1929, the Shabbos before, and in 1960, He's in the Miluyim. How do you say the Miluyim? He's in the reserves for the Israeli army. His commander is Chaim Herzog, who will later become the president of Israel. He was the son of the chief rabbi, Rabbi Yitzchak Isaac Halevi Herzog. He says, the weather is impossible. They were training, and it was just a mabel. It was a flood, and they couldn't continue. So the commander said, go to your trenches. <laughs> So he goes into one of his trenches to protect himself from the rain. And over there, there was another reservist, another man in the reserve. So you start schmoozing, you know, middle of the night in the trenches, was Titman. It's pouring all over the place. You talk, right? You couldn't sleep, so you talk. This man happens to be a researcher of Jewish history in Eretz Yisrael. Who are you, Frank? Who are you? He tells him his name. They start talking about the history of Hebron. And Yaakov Frank says, I want you to know, my Zayda, who's the rabbi of Yerushalayim, still cannot forgive himself for what happened. And the man says to him, I know the whole story, but I just want you to know that this is a crazy, tragic story, what happened in Hebron, and what happened with that boy in particular. But I just want you to know the other part of the story. He says, what's the other part of the story? The boy was murdered. So the other part of the story is as follows. His father was extremely influential with the government. His father heard about it, he lost a son. He ran to the State Department. And he would not stop making a tumul and a shturim and screaming and hollering about the injustice of the British because the British witnessed the massacre. And the Jews were begging the Lord, the British Lord, stop them, shoot, do something. That's how, that's how it stopped. They shot a few bullets and the terrorists dispersed. But for so many hours, they were calm. They were cool. They wouldn't mix in. So they were literally responsible for all this Jewish blood. They didn't murder, but they were completely passive. The police force, the British army, the Lord, they did nothing. And this man was obviously in such grief and pain because of what happened to his own child and what happened to his child's friends and to all of the other Jews in Hebron. And as a result of that, America mixed in and they replaced the British Lord at the time, who was, they called it the Nitziv Habriti, the, the British Lord. They replaced him with a man named, um, his name was uh, Arthur Wakop. In, in Hebrew, they call him Arthur Wakop, Vav of Kuvav Base. But he was a British man, he was a British general, General Wakop. He became in charge. Now the Jews, they didn't know what his attitude is going to be. But this man in 1930, 31 was brought in and he fell in love with the Jewish people. And his attitude was a completely opposite attitude to the point that he opened up the gates of Palestine for Jews of Eastern Europe throughout his tenure which ended in 1936. Hitler becomes Chancellor of Germany in 1933. They all, many, whoever wants, could now come into Israel till 36 because of General Wakov who changed, who changed the laws and allowed so many certificates to be distributed to Jews in Europe to come to Eretz Yisrael, to Palestine, to the point that under his tenure, the Yeshuv is tripled. To the point that there's now a half a million Jews living in Eretz Yisrael. A half a million Jews. Because of this man who was brought in after the massacre of Hebron. So in the trenches, this researcher looks at him and says, I just want you to know, it doesn't justify or rationalize or ease grief, but I just want you to know that hundreds of thousands of Jews were saved from the Holocaust. 
as a result of that father, what he did after the death of his son. And I want you to know that when Jews had to fight back and fight for their land in 1947, 1948, 1949, there were 600,000 Jews. 1% One, 1 was killed. 6,000 Jews were killed in the Independence War. But there were 600,000 Jews. It was all because of Arthur Walker, who was brought in by this boy's father. Because of what happened to his son. I just want you to know that the hundreds of thousands of Jews who were saved, and probably Israel exists because of that number. There was somebody to fight. There was an army that you could put together because the Yeshua was so small and the British were not changing their policy. He's in the trenches. It's 1960. Remember, he was born in 1929, so he was already a man over 30. And he says, you know, my Zayda has to hear this. My Zayda hasn't had one calm night because of guilt. So when they allow him to go home, he's home, he's wet, he's exhausted. He tells his wife, he had already a baby, he says, I have to go to Saba, I have to go to my Zayda, it was Thursday. She says, you go to him every Shabbos, you'll tell him the story on Shabbos. No, I have to go now. She says, why now? She says, because only I know. I know the heart. My Zayda doesn't talk. But I know what he has in his heart. And I'm not going to delay this. And despite the fact that he was so exhausted. You know, you're in trenches for nights. In training, it was hard. Drills, and it was very difficult. He goes to Yerushalayim. And he goes to Zayda, Reb Tzvi Pesach. Frank, who was already an 87-year-old man. And he knocks on the door. And Reb Tzvi Pesach opens the door. And he says, Yankala. I thought you were in the army. He said he got a little time off. I have to speak to you. He says, what happened? Something happened. He said, I have to speak to you. He says, first thing before you speak to me, akoste. you deserve a cup of tea. And he says, his 87-year-old Zayda goes and he makes him a cup of tea. And he, a uh, Yerushalayim, a cup of tea in 1960. And they sit down, they both sit down late at night to drink tea. And he tells his grandfather what he just heard in the middle of the night, last night, in the trenches where they were training. And the Zayda says, wow, 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 wow. It makes me, it gives me a little comfort, a little solace. It doesn't take away the tragedy of that boy or of his family, but it just gives me comfort because I always said I was, a, I always told myself, you're so wicked. Your advice was evil. You caused so much heartache. You know, this just, it just gives me some comfort and solace. And he was just crying in gratitude. And he said, you know, you didn't have to leave your wife and child and come late at night to tell me the story. I have to say, you could have waited a little bit. But I also have to tell you that after you did it already, I am so grateful that you did this right when you did it. Because it literally takes off not one stone, but many boulders and stones off my chest. Zayda walks him to the door, wishes him well, and he says again, you didn't have to do this. You could have done it at a later point, but once you did it, I cannot tell you how grateful I am and how you made me feel. Shabbos, he would always go visit the Zayda. On the way to visit the Zayda, it was just the next Shabbos, he stopped in his sister's home. And his sister says, the Zayda passed away an hour and a half ago. Shabbos morning, suddenly he passed away. And you have nowhere nobody to visit anymore. And then he thought to himself, you know, he was thinking he should wait for Shabbos. He didn't wait for Shabbos. He went the first opportunity and how his grandfather was thankful to him. And those were the last words he heard from him. He added a postscript. He said, in 1977, Menachem Begin became the Prime Minister of Israel. And he was hired to work in the office of the Prime Minister. And in the office of the Prime Minister, he was given the job to help develop new Jewish yeshuvim um, on the other side of the Green Line. As part of his work, he came to America. And when he was in America, he came to New York and he visited the Lubavitcher Rebbe to discuss his plans and the strategy of how to build these Yushavim on the other side of the Green Line. He came in, the Lubavitcher Rebbe asked him for his name. He said, Yaakov Frank, you're related to Tzvi Pesach Frank, my, my, my Zayda. So the Rebbe, he said this over, the Rebbe started to ask him to, to share with him about his Zayda. And he shared with him many stories about his grandfather. The Lubavitcher was very curious and inquisitive. At some point he says, tell me more about your Zayda. So he decided to tell him this story. And he told him this whole story that happened with Hevron and the yeshiva, the Slabotka and Hevron and the massacre. And uh, 
the whole, the whole, the whole Maisa. It's interesting, Rabbi Chevroini, who's today the Rosh Hashiva of Hebron, it's not in Hebron anymore. It's in Yerushalayim, and there's the other part, the Slabotka, which is in Bnei Brak. So the Rosh Hashiva today is Rav Yosef Chevroini, Rav Chaim Yosef David Chevroini, who's a great grandson of Rav Moshe Mordechai Epstein, who was there at the massacre, and he told me Sunday that his great-grandfather collapsed from it. He couldn't come back to himself. He passed away in 34, but very unconsoled because he felt responsibility for the 24 boys who were killed. 1929, in August, there was a guest who came to visit Eretz Yisrael, who was the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, the Rayat Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak. And Rabbi Chavroni told me, I didn't know this, that his late, late, late grandfather, who was the Slabotka Rosh Yeshiva, Rabbi, invited the Lubavitcher Rebbe to come speak in the Yeshiva. He spoke in the Yeshiva, and he left Israel right before the massacre of Hebron. On the boat back to Europe, he heard the story, to America, he heard the story about what happened. This is what Rabbi Chavroni told me. That he spoke in the yeshiva by Rabbi Moshe Mordechai Epstein. So anyway, this is 1977 or 78. Frank is in America and he's telling the Lubavitcher Rebbe, the son-in-law of the Rebbe, the whole story. And then he tells him the end of the story. What happened. So he says, the Lubavitcher Rebbe looks at him and he says, what do we learn from this? What do we learn from what you have done? What we learn from this is sometimes people have dreams of doing good things. But they always tell themselves, I'll do it tomorrow. I'll do it next week. I'll do it next year. He said, what you learn from this is, if it's worthwhile doing it, do it now. (laughs) If it's not worthwhile doing it, then don't do it. But if it's worthwhile doing it, do it now. You know, some of us have a tendency for procrastination, and sometimes it has to do with a little fear and a little anxiety, and what's she going to say, and what's going to happen, and uh, am I going to fail? If it's worth doing it, if you think God wants you to do it, do it now. We call it Zriz, Zriz in Magdimul Mitzvahs. As the Balatanya says, what's the grace of Gedula of the Akeda? Many Jews who didn't speak to God sacrificed themselves and their families. Vayashkim Avram Baboyke, the Zrizus, the alacrity, the agility of Avram Avinu, do it now. Here you have a little example of Haster Aster. What a terrible, terrible time of concealment that was, as throughout our Golas. And yet you also see that there's parts of a story that we never know. And we may, he may have never known this. And his grandfather may have died with that sense of brokenness. He didn't because his grandson cared enough to be able to bring the story together. When everyone looks at their own life, when you look at your own life, you see every one of us, every one of us sitting here or watching or hearing at this point or later, if I had to ask you, describe every journey of your life. And everyone's life is a very interesting story. I've still not met a boring life story. Maybe not everybody knows how to tell their story <laughs> eloquently, but there's no life story that's boring. It can't be. Because a soul is always interesting. And every person is B'Tselem Alekim, so there's something in God, of God in every person's story. But when we look at our journeys, we look at our stories, and sometimes part of those journeys are filled with dark moments. Part of those journeys are filled with moments when we made mistakes. Part of those journeys are filled with moments when we were clueless. When we were literally Hasta Aster, we were in the dark. We were in the dark. We made decisions that were ill-advised. We may have made choices that we later regret. So much of our journey is complex. Sometimes there are painful, simply painful moments in our journeys, caused by ourselves, caused by others, willingly, usually unwillingly, directly, indirectly, consciously, unconsciously. But everyone's story is so nuanced and so sensitive And there's moments of great exhilaration, but there's moments of great sadness. There's moments of profound challenges, stumbling blocks. There's moments a person could say, what if, what if, what if I would have known this? What if she would have not told me this? What if he would have not given me this advice? I'm sure everybody can concoct and create a very interesting list. And then there's even things that if God would give us the option, we would love to press those three buttons, control, alt, delete. You know those three buttons, you ever do that on your computer? If you don't know what I'm talking about, ask your five-year-old. Control, Alt, Delete, Restart, just scratch it out. You remember in the days of typewriters, whiteout? You remember the whiteout? You had to white out stuff. You want to white out stuff. The whole Chiddush of Esther, Megillus Esther, is to give us another perspective. And the other perspective is that there is a singular story that makes up every person's life. There's a singular story, and every detail is somehow part of that journey. 
I may know it today. I may not know it today. I may see it tomorrow. I may see it at a future date. I may not always see it. The Aleph is always there even if it's invisible. And even if it's tiny. And even if I have to strain my eyes and look and find it. But I'll find it. But for this I have to have those words as the thematic mission statement of my life. Your birth is not a mistake. Your existence is not a mistake. Where you were born, where you grew up, your gifts, your resources, your talents, your personality, and your challenges, your resources, your blessings, and also those things that we see and appear as deficiencies, as flaws, the question marks, the hasta aster, the darkness, the night, it's all part of a singular story. And one cannot reach the place of La Yehudim Haisa Eirev Simcha Vesasim Vikar. If I want to blot out part of the story, if I want to say that stupid party, just get it out of my system. I cannot reach my place of light. I cannot reach my own redemption. We cannot reach our redemption if we do not have the courage to encompass and include. Every single part of the story, it all makes one story and it's the story of Purim. The story of those things that seem random, inconsequential, valueless, at best, at worst, bad, negative, toxic, tragic, certainly stupid, superficial, foolish, mistakes, random mistakes, just somebody casting lots. This person ended up here, this person ended up there, and just with a little roll of dice. As Einstein said, does God play dice with the universe? But Judaism says God does play dice with the universe, but what you think is just random dice is really Purim. It's a mi yideyim le'es kozoi sigat l'malchus. Einstein fought with a man named Heisenberg about quantum mechanics because he said science has to make sense. God doesn't play dice with the universe. This was Einstein's expression. And quantum mechanics seems so random. Heisenberg wrote back to Einstein, don't tell God what to do. <laughs> if he wants to play dice, he plays dice. But the real deeper argument is, Einstein was a brilliant man, but he always wanted to see the patterns. And he wanted patterns that make sense. We all like patterns that make sense. But even what seems like dice, Purim is exactly that. It's playing dice. That's what a girl is. You play dice. You got a six, I got a five, you got a four, you got a three. And that they chose as the name. Esther and Mardechai, the Anshei Knesset Zagdaila, chose that as the name. Why? Because the essence of Purim is that there's two Purs. There's Haman's lot and there's God's lot. It should have been Pur. There was one lot. No, there's Purim. There's a double lot. There's the girl, the way Haman looks at it. Vayikar, and then there's another girl. And that's the girl of Yom Kippur. The Kohen Gadol also made a girl on Yom Kippur. There were two goats. Purim is Yom HaKippurim. It says in Zoya, Yom Kippur is Kippurim. It's like Purim. What's the connection? Both are days. Yom Kippur and Purim are the two most remote days in the calendar. <laughs> if anybody asks you, which day is the most similar to Purim? The last day you're going to say is Yom Kippur. It's a whole different ambiance. That's not how, that's not how the Zoya saw it. It's interesting. We look at Purim, it's like, you know, everybody's, uh, either you're drunk, and if you're sober, you know, you're stressed about Shalach Manas. Purim, you're not, you're not thinking about food. But the truth is, Purim is a serious day. <laughs> In a way, it's more serious than Yom Kippur. It's a different type of seriousness. <coughs> I once had a mashpi, his name was Abiyoyal Khan. So it was a Purim Suda, so there was a boy there, it was very funny, he was like a com comedian. So he was making jokes. So the Biel turns to him and he says in Yiddish, "The jokes are in good for Tisha B'av. Yet there's a Eden's to talk. <laughs> Your jokes leave for Tisha B'av. Yom Kippur is a serious, yeah, Purim is a serious day. Meaning, the Zoya says, Yom HaKippurim is Kippurim. Yom Kippur is like Purim. That means that Purim is even deeper than Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is also a day of Gairo. What does it represent? It represents this truth. That the story of a person's life is unified. The key is never to see myself as a victim. Never to surrender to a depression, to a resignation because of trying to figure things out based on my own limited tools and realize that what looks like a poor from Haman 
Osa has another goyro. Osa has another dimension. And to open my heart and say, how will I answer my question? At this moment in history of mi yoideya im laes kazois, he got lamalchus. Have a wonderful week. Be'ezer Hashem, next week we will have a class, a Purim class as well. Always, Hashem speaks through everybody. Uh, thank you. Vayikra, not Vayikra, exactly. Vayikra. Yes, and the inside Vayikra, Vayikra is from Rabbi Jonathan Sachs with Mio Idea, the connection. Beautiful insight from, from England. Okay. Lord Sachs. Zechroi like Nelevracha. Okay. Bezer Hashem. You're right. You're right. There's so many people that you want to, you want them to hear. No, but it's like you're rushing before Shabbos. I have to print it's a pleasure to have you back. It's a pleasure to have you back. It's a pleasure to be I, back. I pleasure to have you. You came from Lakewood? I went to that expo from that show. Oh, wow. It's unbelievable. Wow. Unbelievable what these schools do. Yes, yes. It's like a museum. My used to come here, and so she told me yes. I you on the thing. I also wanted to announce, I wanted to announce, I did this last week, that we crea- I, me and some friends created a fund for 17 communities of Ukraine, jewsofukraine.com, to help them, the refugees in the communities, jewsofukraine.com. Yes, 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 I know her. Oh, Gvaldik. Okay. I know some of your nephews, yeah. A lot of Hatzlacha, yes. Yeah. Uh, with Lakewood, yeah, yeah. And it was fascinating, fascinating, fascinating. Thank you. I mean, I'm 